In honor of International Women's Rights Day, the University of Pennsylvania Law School is thrilled to host Aisha Oyabadi at our law school. Aisha Oyabadi is one of the most admired women's rights advocate and activist in Nigeria. In the aftermath of the Boko Haram kidnapping of the Chibok girls in 2014, Aisha Oyabadi co-convened Bring Back Our Girls campaign, a campaign that has riveted the world's interest. Her commitment to the education of women and girls remains something that has convinced her to continue her education. And today, Aisha is a graduate student studying for her PhD at University College London. It is extraordinary that a woman who has spent her entire life fighting for the rights of the girl child to access education continues in her own journey to education. This highly accomplished lawyer already has an LLB and a master's degree in law. But because of her own conviction and her commitment to the goals of education and the power and the transformative power of education, she continues in her journey to education. She's also the founder and the leader of the Murtala Mohammed Foundation, which is again committed to the rights of the girl child's education. So, Aisha, you have been not only an activist and a practitioner, but a scholar who has studied deeply the ways in which violence against women in Nigeria is linked with the violence of Boko Haram. Your own scholarship argues that Boko Haram's deliberate and conscious use of sexual violence is a weapon of war and terror. And this is very consistent with the jurisprudence of the Rome Statute as well as uh, the jurisprudence of the UN Special Representative for Sexual Violence in Conflict. The former Special Representative Zainab Bangura has said sexual violence in conflict is the great moral issue of our time. But what is so interesting about your argument is that the Boko Haram violence is linked to the violence of the state and the everyday violence against women. So I think what is so interesting and intriguing about your argument is that you cannot separate the violence that Boko Haram wrecks in Nigeria with the, the climate of violence in Nigeria. Yes, because, um, you know, the violence you have seen with Boko Haram is unprecedented in the history of the world. Um, which, let's start with first with the abduction of women and girls. Over 2,000 plus women and girls have been abducted in the um, eight years um, um, insurgency, Boko Haram insurgency. And, um, you know, the more famous one is the abduction of the um, Chibok girls on the, um, April 14th, um, 2014, where they went into a school in Chibok um, young women were getting ready to take their um, school leaving examinations in a community where already it's very difficult to encourage women to go to school. We can imagine the um, devastation um, that that caused. Um, they kidnapped 276 girls, of which 57 of them escaped immediately in the aftermath of it. And that's part of, you know, the reflection of the state violence. How is it possible? It took them 24 hours to get from Chibok to Sambisa Forest. They were on the outskirts of Sambisa Forest for three days and nobody was able to rescue those girls. It's the same problem we're seeing with the Dapchi girls that have just been um, recently um, abducted. The attitude, the lack of um, a high standard of care, you know, the lack of what you'd call due diligence. How is it that the state is allowing these things to continue to happen? A month and a half before the Chibok kidnappings. Um, Boko Haram had gone into a school in February. In Northeast Nigeria, they had killed over 50 
um, boys and they locked away the girls and they said to the girls, go home, we don't want you to go to school. So it was clear that this was going to happen. Even with Dapchi, we know it's going to happen. And the extent of the violence is so overwhelming, you know, and then, you know, then the girls now face the additional jeopardy, I call it double jeopardy, of being forced to marry. So there's sexual exploitation, they're used as um, sexual slaves, rewards to um, Boko Haram men, and then this whole issue of trying to use the girls to propagate their sect. So you have a situation where young girls are abducted, they're forced to marry, and they're forced to bear children for the sex. And they come back and the stigma in the society is huge. And this is also a society anyway that already acknowledges forced marriage as a means and a way of life. So you wonder at this, at what juncture, who actually is standing up for women, who is protecting their rights. In all of this conversation, you then have Boko Haram using women and girls as suicide bombers. In the entire history of the world, Boko Haram has used the most number of women and girls as suicide bombers. The last Economist magazine report was at over 200 plus girls. There's a study going on at King's College London where the girls were talking about almost 400 plus women and girls as suicide bombers in the last eight years. So my study at um, the School of Oriental and African Studies at University of London, my case study is actually Boko Haram suicide bombers. What does it tell us about complicity of suicide um, bombers? You know, until Boko Haram, the profile of a, um, sorry, a profile of a typical suicide bomber is male, 28, on my, single, without children. Where we had women, they were considered to have full agency because they were usually part of the organization. We now have a situation where girls, suicide, female suicide bombers that Boko Haram is as young as seven, um, female, like we said, many of them have been abducted. And even those who have agency, how much agency can you have in this kind of constrained environment? Then when we now find the girls, because there are some girls whose bombs didn't detonate, when we then find the girls, we also realize that they've been subjected to violence in the hands of the state. These girls are assaulted, they're beaten, they're sexually violated, and we also believe that there's a history of summary execution. Because over 30-something girls have been found, so far we are only able to trace um, 10. So this violence has many authors. So Aisha, a couple of interesting elements of your scholarship and your research that I have been struck with. One is the fact that you connect um, Boko Haram and the violence of Boko Haram to uh, issues of child marriage one, and two, to issues of the girl child's access to education. So the, the term Boko Haram itself means in Hausa, Western education is a sin. So there is a war against girls' education, not just in Nigeria, but around the world, what we see, whether it's from Malala to uh, the girls of Chibok, there is a war being waged against a girl's education because as Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said, what is it about a girl with a pencil that so frightens a man with a gun? So an educated girl is more powerful, more dangerous than a drone in the fight against extremism and in the fight against terrorism. So your work has seen the connection of education and raising the age of marriage, making mandatory the age of marriage for girls and then uh, addressing issues of terrorism and, viol and sexual abuse in conflict. So that's one thread that I see. The second thread is the ways in which you have analyzed the children's rights law and the ways in which the loopholes in the children's rights law and in the constitution lend themselves to furthering 
violence against women and the inequality of women and girls. So for example, what you have said is although there is a, a provision that raises the age of marriage for girls, there is also a, a provision that calls for age of majority or puberty at the time of marriage. So even if you've got married at the age of nine, you've considered to have reached an age of majority or puberty. So it nullifies that uh, uh, raise in the age of marriage. So can you speak to all three elements that I have outlined because I think they're all interlinked. Fine. Um, so one of the things I say is that um, those who define consent are the gatekeepers of force, which means that we're now talking about um, the um, legislators as well as even the executive. Um, if you look at the Child's Rights Act, which has been praised as being one of the most progressive laws that we can have mm -hmm. that impacts the rights of children, and especially because it calls, um, you know, calls out you know, the issue regarding the um, age of consent. Up to that time, a lot of the laws skirted around it, but this act is clear. Age of consent is 18. So, which means that it challenges a lot of cultural practices mm -hmm. and it challenges the laws mm -hmm. that came before the Child's Right Act. But what um, the Child's Right Act has to be domesticated mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the law, um, children are on the residual list, mm -hmm. which means that the state governments have to actually domesticate. Well, if you look at where do we have the most challenges, it's in the northern part of the country, and those are the states mm -hmm. that refuse to domesticate that law. Mm -hmm. And then this is further fueled by various provisions in the Constitution, for example, that recognize customary marriages. And the argument, therefore, that if it recognizes customary marriages, it recognizes what they call Islamic marriages. And, um, and their argument is that Islam does not mm -hmm. define the age of uh, marriage and that the relevant age is puberty. Now, if you realize that children, especially now, are getting into puberty much earlier. Girls, people want to marry girls at 11. Then you have provisions in the constitution that allow women to denounce their citizenship when they're of age. And then it says, prov provides that a woman is considered to be of age once she's married. So if you apply traditional or cultural laws which allow you to marry a girl, a pre prepubescent girl, then it means that what you are saying is that that girl has a right to denounce her um, citizenship. So how can you give such a formidable right to a child that cannot define, that has no other rights, no right to freedom, no right to personal liberty because she's been forced to marry at 11. So these are some of the things that we're dealing with. And then we wonder why Boko Haram is that violent if there's so much violence that is endemic within our society against women. And that needs to change for us to see the kind of change, for us to be able to call out groups like Boko Haram. We need to first look inwards and see how we can make those changes that are required. Our legislators will not support for us to expunge the um, provision in the constitution that talks about, that um, encourages a woman who is, um, th that suggests that a woman who is married is of age because they wish to marry young girls. Many of them think that, and you know, it's interesting because it actually has very little to do with Islam, has very little to do with religion. It's actually just about culture. You know, it's about culture, but it has become so ingrained that it's very, it's very, very difficult to challenge. Your work, Aisha, has been about localizing international human rights norms into local idiom and into the vernacular. As I've said before, you've acted as a translator in Nigeria, translating these international human rights principles, guarantees, and norms into local practice 
through what I call a uh, effort to vernacularize international human rights laws. So that is the domestication process. That is the process that takes international human rights laws and make them into domestic norms, principles and rules. So can you share with us very quickly some of the practical ways in which you have done that? Okay, so um, apart from taking the international norms and domesticating them into national law, there's also a provision because Nigeria is a federal system. So you have to, when laws, federal laws are enacted, those laws also have to be translated into the local state laws. And if they don't, then those laws just remain out there in the books. And that is the problem with the Child's Rights Act. Until the state governments accept and agree to um, produce their own state version of that law, that law is not applicable in the state. So which means that only certain states in Nigeria have accepted the child's right law into domestic, their state domestic law. The um, states that are most affected especially in the northeast part of the country, including Bono State, where Boko Haram emanated from, have refused to domesticate that law. And finally, you write very eloquently about the need to break the silence and your work, both as a spokesperson and as a scholar, has been about breaking the silence, revealing the gaps in the law, gaps in the constitution, revealing these narratives, the unspoken narratives, of these girls and giving them voice. So breaking the silence has been one of the most important and powerful ways in which you have advocated for uh, the girls of Nigeria, but also have been one of the most powerful voices in the Bring Back Our Girls efforts. So Aisha, your brilliant analysis reveals a couple of things. One is the importance of, as you have said so eloquently, the domestication of international human rights norms into context in Nigeria. Second is, and as you've written about this, there are the silences in the Quranic text. How can we fill those silences with a progressive analysis, a progressive interpretation of uh, Islam. And then thirdly, and this brings me to your conclusion um, in your study on this issue uh, for the publication that we've launched just today, where you say that the wall of silence needs to be broken, yeah. right? And I want to end by quoting you, Aisha, when you say, until we are able to remove the wall of silence and begin to speak about the unspeakable, it is going to be difficult for those victims to seek and find justice. So thank you, Aisha, for your work. This is some of the most powerful, powerful forms of advocacy, the way in which you are marrying scholarship academic uh, efforts to your activism and efforts on the ground. And Penn Law wishes you every good wish and good luck in this effort. But most of all, you have our admiration and our congratulations. Thank you very much, Nangita.